Hey guys, welcome to another edition of EXP Cast. This is uh, Tyler. We have Tara, Nick, and another one of our members was our first time being on the podcast. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. This is your favorite editor out there, Josh. Uh, Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, let's see. I'm currently studying uh, to get a bachelor's degree in English with a double minor in uh, Spanish and Japanese. I'm hoping to one day make it into the video game industry, uh, more specifically in the role of a, uh, as being part of a writing team. And as far as short-term goals, I'm really more interested in just uh, helping new students uh, easing into the college scene and becoming an academic advisor. All right. So tonight, and I know you guys are excited about this, we are going to cover Mass Effect 3. It came out not too long ago, and there is plenty to talk about. Um, first, let's start off with the multiplayer. So what are your guys' impressions of the multiplayer? I know you, you have both been playing it pretty extensively from what I've heard. Yeah, I think uh, Josh and I have an N7 rank of about 200 of each, mm -hmm. and we, uh, we've promoted our characters quite a few times, so yeah, we have, we have quite a few hours logged in it. Oh yeah. So, uh, what sets this multiplayer aside from other third-person shooter multiplayers? I haven't really played too. I played Gears of War, but aside from that, I haven't played too many other third-person multiplayers. But what I think sets it apart is the leveling system, um, and maybe the amount of customization that people have in their characters. Mm -hmm. And we should probably point out real quick that the reason Terra is bringing up Gears of War is because for those of you who are not familiar with the multiplayer, basically what it boils down to is that it is the horde mode. From uh, uh, Gears of War 2. Yes, Gears of War 2, uh, that particular multiplayer mode. And like she said, it's a little different on how it's presented in that you do face waves of enemies, but eventually they do stop. It's not never ending. And uh, there is a leveling system similar to what you see in the single player campaign where you, uh, you have all these powers to choose from and there are two different branches that you can take on how to develop those powers. So you get a lot of customization with these characters, not just in the powers, but in other aspects as well, such as uh, the appearances of your characters, the weapons that they carry. There's really a very extensive uh, customization that you can have in this multiplayer. And when you, uh, when you win the matches, you get credits, which you can use to buy packs, which give you further customization by upgrading your weapons and unlocking new like appearance options. Yeah. Now, uh, I was going to ask, you know, leveling up and being able to buy new abilities and that kind of stuff, that's, that's not really a very new thing for shooters in general. I mean, like, you know, Call of Duty has always had it. Uh, Borderlands has a level, like a whole level tree system. Like uh, Operation Raccoon City, you can use all of your money and points to buy upgrades. What really sets this apart from all the other games out there as far as multiplayer goes? Well, since you've mentioned the weapons and how Call of Duty and uh, Resident Evil uh, present them to you, one of the primary differences is, like Tara said, you gain credits in order to uh, buy these things called packs. And there's various packs out there. Sometimes they change on the weekends depending on if there's an event going on. But basically you have three packs and they each offer you a certain amount of items with a certain chance of getting... Uh, rare or uncommon items. But the thing is, is that as a player in the multiplayer, you are given the most basic of weapons, and that is really all that is given to you. If you want the more uh, powerful, the more uh, fancy weapons that are out there, that are available in the multiplayer, you have to buy these packs, but it's completely randomized on what you get. So even if you by, let's say, the Spectre Pack, which is the most expensive, you will get a rare item, but there's no telling what that rare yeah. item will be. It might be a gun, it might be a modification to a gun, it could be an improved version of a gun that you already have. So it's basically like getting like a booster pack of like, like trading cards, basically. You just don't know what's going to be in it. Yeah, yeah, like buying them feels a lot like opening a pack of cards. Like, you're really hoping for something good that you like, but it could That's, be anything. It's kind of exciting. Um, so... I know one of the things that, that I thought really set the game apart, as far as the multiplayer goes, the fact that you can you actually get to pick different races for your character that you're customizing. How does that really play into a, in the differences for the, from character to character? Well, I guess we could start with the, the races that are playable, which is Asari, Human, Quarian, uh, Solarian, uh, Turian. Is there any other ones, Josh? 
Uh, Drell and Krogan. Drell and Krogan. So, so what are each of these different races have special about? Like, I mean, a lot of people out there may not know about the races if they're if they're sitting on this. So, well, um, let's just pick one particular class to uh, explain this because each class has its uh, different powers. But for this example, we're going to talk about the uh, Vanguard class. Now, the thing is, is that uh, each of these classes has four characters that you can pick to two from. Two humans of both genders, uh, and uh, two alien races that are more fitted for the job. In the case of the Vanguard, it's the Drell and the Asari. Now, the humans will have the same abilities, which are Biotic Charge, uh, Nova, and... What's the other one? That uh, Shockwave. Up? Shockwave, yes. Which no one uses. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But in contrast, the Asari will have a different set of powers. They all have biotic charge, the Drell included, but she, uh, the Asari has different powers. She has stasis and a lift grenade, whereas the Drell has a pull and cluster grenade. So usually there's one central power that each class has, and the other races, which are non-human, get different powers depending on the race. So a Solarian usually has energy drain, regardless of class, because it's usually a Solarian ability. Right. So, so what's the, uh, what's, uh, I guess, what, what's the point of playing human then? If you have these other classes with these special abilities, like what do humans get to set them apart? Well, humans, like aside from the, the abilities themselves, like for example, as a Vanguard, I would personally choose human because the ability Nova, which is exclusive to humans, is I think much better than okay. the other ones out there. Aside from that, the, all the races have different shields and HP values that they can like get to. Mm -hmm. um, they also have different dodges. So when you're evading attacks, like you do a quick roll, a human has a simple roll. Um, the Solarians do a slightly faster one that goes not as far. The Asari use up their shields in order to like kind of like teleport, but they, and that mm -hmm. one has no um, there's no animation for it, so you can keep doing it really fast. Unlike the rolls, which you have to like get back up, which kind of keep you in one place for a second. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, so so really, it feels like you know, so the the male and female get the exact same stuff, right? Yeah, male yes. and female so, humans are exactly the so, same. So so it basically gives you like a like a, a male femme chef kind of option. Yeah, actually, Basically. the the female human voice is the is female shepherd's voice. So yes. all the the grunts and yells are female shepherd. <laughs> so so what about the enemies? Like what enemy? Like are you fighting the same enemies you play during like the multi the, the single player campaign when you're playing multiplayer? Or like what what are they throwing at you exactly? Well, in the multiplayer, there are uh, as of this recording, there are three factions of enemies that you can fight. You can uh, go against Cerberus, the Geth, or the Reapers. So just give, give us a little insight of what, what exactly uh, these three these three factions are. Um, well, basically, hmm, it's hard to say really. Well, the Cerberus are human enemies, so they they uh, they are a little bit easier to get headshots on, which people like. They all come with all the different sets of enemies have different, I guess, advantages and disadvantages to them. For example, Reapers are uh, organic. Uh, an organic enemy, which means that like Corians and Solarians use uh, tech abilities on them, and they won't be very effective. So they don't have like shields to break down; and they can't gotcha. be stunned. Uh, an advantage to uh, or an advantage for the Geth is that they have pyros, which are like flamethrower things. Mm -hmm. But their weakness is that they're very vulnerable to shield destruction and tech abilities. All right, so so you basically have to plan your strategy around which faction you're fighting at the time, right? Yes, yes but most people play uh, random map, random enemy, because you get a 25 experience bonus, 25 percent experience that is bonus. Good to know. <laughs> so you could build your like people who do gold matches, which is the hardest kind of match you can do. Usually will plan. Kind of yeah, strategy. yeah, they'll, yeah. They'll, well, they usually pick the pick the map and the enemy so they have a better chance of winning so they can plan for it because gold mode's really hard. So they might pick like Geth and like Firebase White and they'll pick, you know, Corians and Solarians and Infiltrators and Engineers because those are very good against synthetic enemies. Tell them just how hard gold is I in think comparison. <laughs> they released the stats for the multiplayer and less than 1% of all matches won are gold. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that sound that sounds really difficult. I know, but by, by comparison, uh, playing Gears of War and the, the newest edition for Horde Mode Three, uh, since they come in at waves, each wave has like a different set of enemies, and like I think it's like every five or every ten waves, you actually have to fight a boss enemy on the map, like, like like a Brumac, like the giant thing with like the chain guns all over it, or you got to fight like like Lambent Berserkers. Like, do you fight any kind of boss like enemies in uh, Mass Effect? Yeah, each each of the. Uh, the factions has different boss enemies. For Cerberus, it's 
uh, phantoms, which are a lot like the Kai Lane character in the single player, kind of like a ninja character. And let's see, what else do they have? They have atlases, which are giant mechanized machines. Um, what do the Reapers have, Josh? Uh, the Reapers have... Uh, well, actually, the Reapers have three. They have the Ravagers, which are uh, altered uh, rachni that have been Reaperized. Uh, basically, they shoot these very fast missiles at you that can pretty much uh, kill you within two seconds if you're not paying attention. They have the Brutes, which are slow moving, but if they get close enough, they'll lunge at you and can take your shield down with one hit. And then there's the Banshees, oh, which God. are very similar, actually, to um, Asari playable characters in that if they get too far, if you get too far away from them, they will begin to... Uh, teleport uh, short distances in order to close the gap between you and them. And all of these boss characters, well, the Banshees and the Atlases and the Brutes all have the ability to one-hit kill any player that they are close to. Mm -hmm. Word to the wise, vanguards, do not charge a Banshee. <laughs> I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> so, uh, on another note, uh, so what are so for the people out there who haven't really you know, gotten a good grasp of what the classes are, um, what are the classes that are in Mass Effect so far, and what are, what are the, like, the, the themes for each of them? Well, there's, think of it this way, there's three basic abilities. There's combat strength, biotic strength, and tech strength. There are six classes, and they're all a combination of these three abilities. So mm -hmm. being pure tech is an engineer, being pure biotic is an adept, being pure combat is a soldier. But you can also have someone who's half, adi or half biotic, half tech, and that would be a sentinel. And you get the other classes by combining all the three aspects in different ways. So you can either be half strength for two or full strength in one. Uh, so what? So you said there were it was combat, biotics, and what was the third one? Tech. So what do what do biotics and tech like? How do those really take a play in the game? Like what exactly do they do? Uh, well, I'll go ahead and explain biotics because that's uh, what I tend to use more. Basically, um, biotics are very good against enemies that do not have uh, shields. Um, so enemies that have only health bars, biotics are very good against. You can usually one shot an enemy if your uh, biotic ability is strong enough. They are also very good against enemies that have uh, barrier powers and armor protecting them. There are specific biotic powers that can very quickly drain away those two uh, kinds of bars. All right. So, um, and the uh, the other one was tech. So is tech like like the engineer stuff? Like yeah, tech would be an engineer sentinel. Uh, they basically have abilities geared towards damaging synthetics and stunning them. Okay. So another, what kind of roles do you think the classes play? Like, I've noticed some people say that some some classes are more support class, some are more assault class, like... Uh, yeah, I would say that, like, for example, there's not really, like, tank DPS and healing, because there is no healing. Yeah. Um, most, like, for, like, a vanguard, you could say, is a frontline fighter. They are good at uh, distracting the enemy and charging into the front and taking all the fire. Um, and maybe, like, a sentinel or an engineer is good at, at a support role, as in, like, you know, hitting things from far away... Um, and then the infil an infiltrator is a sniper, so they're, of course, going to hang back, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, which classes do you guys think are easier to play? Because I know with my experience from the multiplayer, I was messing around, and I, th I think I made a, a vanguard, a soldier, and an infiltrator. And I tried playing the infiltrator just in a, in a map for, like, like, three other people, and, like, I was getting, like, destroyed like, left and right. Like, they have, like, they seem to have, like, very little to no, to no health as compared to soldier, which I picked up, and I was just blowing through everything as a soldier. Well... See, the thing is, is that having a uh, quote-unquote easiest class to play, it's really actually hard to pin that uh, sort of thing down in the Mass Effect multiplayer because, as we said earlier, it really depends on the situation that you're thrown into depending on what map you end up on and who you're fighting against. Like, I personally uh, am starting to find... Uh, it easier to play an engineer but the thing is is that if I'm not fighting the Geth and I'm fighting the Reapers or the Cerberus I do have a noticeably harder time against them I'm not gonna say that it's necessarily impossible but you definitely notice that you are at a disadvantage if you're not fighting a certain type of uh, faction that's weak to your particular abilities. Alright, so I guess, I guess a better way to put it, which would be the one that has the lowest learning curve? I would say Soldier's probably the easiest for a new player to get into because you don't have to worry about your powers so much. They're very reliant on their weapons. Mm -hmm. So you just have to know how to aim and shoot and you don't have to worry about the strategy you need to, how you need to, you know, shoot powers and win and what they're good against. You just need to worry about, you know, you have your guns, they're good guns, go shoot things. Yeah. yeah. So uh, another thing I wanted to mention is the, uh, the implementation of uh, melee attacks and stuff. 
So that's not one thing I, I hadn't really seen before until three. And it was, was it wasn't anything else before three, was it? Like the there were melee attacks in Mass Effect too. Mm-hmm. But like I, from the, from what I've seen, like, they look a lot different this time around. So what what how exactly did the melee the melee combat work in the game? Well, like I I know the vanguards get a biotic punch. There is an omni blade stab, and then the Asari have this AOE uh, biotic like Nova that they do. Um, there's really, I don't know what else to say about it other than it's just good for if you're up close to an enemy, you don't really have a way to get away, you just punch them. Are there yeah. any, like, one-hit kill, uh, like, melee moves or anything like that? Or there is like... actually one. If you use grab, you, if, only certain classes can use it. I know soldier is one of them. If you are behind cover and an enemy is in front of your cover, you can do a grab attack where you grab them, pull them over the cover, and just punch them into the ground. And they instantly <laughs> die no matter what they are. Awesome. Try that on a banshee. I don't know if it works on Banshees, but <laughs> most enemies. <laughs> Alright, so is there, is there any more topics you guys want to hit on the multiplayer? Anything else you guys feel like is worth mentioning at this point for the audience out there? I mean, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I would definitely mm-hmm. recommend it to people who maybe don't even care about the single player. I mean, the multiplayer by itself is a really fun experience. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know I'm still catching up with the series, and that's, that's my uh, incident for getting it, because I've always been a big fan of the third-person shooter games, especially with, you know, like, cover-based combat and... Now, like, the, I think I really do think that the team tactics and the, the class-based system is what's going to set this apart as far as multiplayer goes. So would you guys say it's definitely worth the purchase, like, even if you're just there for the multiplayer? Oh, yeah. Definitely. How many hours do you think you guys have clocked so far in the multiplayer? Well, each game is about 20 minutes long, because you fight 10 waves of enemies, and it usually takes anywhere between 20 and 40 minutes if you do gold. Sometimes it takes that long, but, uh... I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe, like, 20, 30 hours. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just in the multiplayer. So as long as a single player. That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's move on to another topic. Let's move on to the actual single player campaign. Uh, this is the part where start, we could possibly start getting into spoilers, so if anyone out there is uh, wondering to not get spoiled, then turn the fucking video off. Daniel. We really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're talking to you, Daniel. We know you're going to hear this eventually. Just shut it off. Or if you're going to beat it, well then, whatever. <laughs> so... How do you guys feel about the, the single player campaign? I know you guys have both beaten it already. Yes. Yeah. Without without touching the ending, which we'll talk about later, how do you guys feel about the campaign this time around? I guess we'll just go around. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the single player campaign up until the ending. Uh, I felt everything in the game was, the story was just very engaging, and there were a lot of moments that, you know, almost made you cry and made you laugh, and it's just like one of the, one of the most immersive stories in a game I've ever played. Mm-hmm. Yes. This game, the campaign, the story, it's just, it's a really, really good wrap-up to the Mass Effect series because you're starting to see all of these characters that you've been meeting ever since you started in one. You're seeing how your actions have affected them, what's happening with the universe. It's just, it's very emotionally engaging, like Tara said. Uh, You know, you're crying, you're laughing, but definitely... One thing is that after you have gotten through the campaign, you will definitely be feeling something. There, there. I just can't think that there is anyone out there who can get through this campaign and just not feel anything so, so for it's, the characters. It's pretty moving, having invested that much time over three games and finally getting a closure to it. It's very moving, yes. All right. So, um, like, what what's really what really popped out during the campaign mode? You like, what what are some of your favorite moments? I really set this apart from the last two and. Two encounters. Uh, favorite moments? Okay, I'll name about two or three, so there's some left for, for Josh, but I think <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my favorite moments is when uh, Morden dies. Not that I like him dying, but just the moment itself was just very sad, and like, it just brought a lot of emotion, and I don't know, it was, it was one of the top moments. Um, I think the other one would be, let me think. Well, why don't you go ahead, Josh, while I think of it. <laughs> of a favorite moment? Yeah. All right, um... Hmm. I'm going to have to say that m- one of my favorite moments was probably when Shepard arrived on Thessia to find uh, what inevitably turned out to be the Prothean Beacon. And just, uh, you know, the way that that mission failed and how he had to sit there and just watch as the Reapers burned Thessia to the ground, it was very, very tragic. You could tell 
that it was definitely weighing on Shepard. And that is one of the moments that I like to point out whenever people ask me this, because it's just a very great example of how much attention the writers are putting into showing the audience, you know, how this wartime situation is really affecting the characters. So, ha were there any moments in the game, like, loss, like, tragic loss of a character everyone enjoyed, like, like, like an heiress dying in Final Fantasy VII, like, really, <laughs> you were like, no, like, are there any deaths in the game that you think are going to go down in history? Uh, well, there, there, it really depends, I would say for, like, a, a typical playthrough where all the characters from 2 lived, uh, probably Thane's death was pretty, pretty good for most people because there was, like, a nice moment with, like, a prayer that he did, and... I think most people rank that as one of the top moments of the game as well, um, and then there was Morden. Uh, I guess, like, I guess delving a little bit into the ending too. Shepard usually dies at the end, and that'll probably be something people remember. <laughs> yeah. And so, so we're like, oh, go ahead, no. oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say um, that for that question, I was gonna say um, Morden's death was definitely the most uh, memorable for me, because he was definitely one of my favorite characters in two, and it was just a very noble sacrifice that he had made as penance for this uh, mistake that he had made back when they originally created the genophage. Um, so, like, are there any characters that you were just like, like, if you had to name, like, the one character you're generally going to miss the most that passed away during the game, who would you have to say it was? Uh, I think, again, it would have to be Morton. He was just a hilarious character that I think most people love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So do you guys have any qualms about it? Like, anything that you really feel like was a bad direction to take story-wise? Like, again, excluding the ending for the time being. <laughs> like, is there, is there anything you really wish they hadn't done story-wise? I, I wish there was more, I guess. Like, I, I really don't think there's anything they shouldn't have done, but I, I'm really just eager for more content yeah. to blow through. <laughs> well, the, the, there is going to be DLC story added, correct? Like, yeah. At the, if, when you beat the game, they tell you Shepard's adventures will continue through DLC and has become a legend by defeating the Reapers or something like that. So, wait, so are these are these going to expand on after the story? or I, like... Well, we, no one knows for sure. Uh, hmm. You would think with how it ends that you couldn't expand on it, really. So the DLC yeah. might be before Mass Effect 3 or during it somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I know the way that... Uh, that, uh, what was it, Fallout, uh, Fallout 3, the first Fallout, uh, Fallout 3 uh, handled DLC was basically that they just added on, you know, like, right after you, you're supposedly pass away, like, you wake up and you continue your DLC from there. So, um, let's see what else. Um, really, is it, like, is there, like, I don't know what to say about that. I think that's pretty much all we've got to say about the story right now, unless there's anything really in particular that really stood out to you guys that you want to mention that hasn't been mentioned already. Um, well, maybe the, the DLC character, if you want to talk about the DLC stuff right sure, now. Sure, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that. Uh, the DLC character, which surprised a lot of people, is a Prothean, which supposedly are these extinct uh, people from 50,000 years ago. Um, there were a lot of people who were upset with his character design, because he looked like a collector from Mass Effect 2, which is a certain alien race um, that looks nothing like a Prothean from Mass Effect 1. Because the Protheans in Mass Effect 1 were these long, gangly things with, like, tentacles on their face, and Javik, the Prothean character in 3, kind of looks like a, like a bug alien thing, which doesn't look anything like the ones from 1, but aside from that, he was a very interesting character, and I think he added a lot to the, the game, because you got an insight into the Prothean civilization. Mm -hmm. So I know another, another thing that caused, uh, like, a stir is the fact that uh, now you can have a male Shep uh, date dudes now. So, yeah. uh, how exactly did that work out in gameplay? Uh, what do you mean in gameplay? Like, uh, like what were the what were the male options for Shep? Well, for male Shep, uh, as far as the gay options are concerned, uh, there is your um, shuttle, uh, your shuttle uh, pilot, Cortez, and there's also Caden, and uh, that is it for gay options for male Shep. Um. As far as uh, who you pick, uh, I actually had uh, Ashley alive on my playthrough, so I don't really know what happens with Cadence. But with Cortez, it doesn't really affect um, what happens in the gameplay if you decide to romance him. There are certain lines that they exchange uh, as you're progressing through missions that might make you think they're exclusive to the romance. But if you actually replay them again as like uh, Femshep, for example, and you don't seduce him, they're actually the same lines. But as far as the story itself, outside of the shoot 'em up gameplay, 
it's actually a very, very moving situation that Cortez has uh, going for him. And it really seemed like they put as much detail into his love story and uh, that entire arc as they would for an actual squad mate who can fight with you side by side. And yeah, uh, Femship has had like you know lesbian options since Mass Effect One, which and it always bothered people that you know male ship didn't have the same options. Yeah. So a lot of people are happy about it, but there's also people who don't like it because they think it doesn't make sense that suddenly Shepard's gay or suddenly Caden's gay. But other than that, I think most people are pretty pleased with it. There were there were gay options in two, weren't there? Mm-hmm. No, no, not even. No, he was exclusively straight in one and two. Well, Caden wasn't really... You didn't really interact with Caden in Mass Effect too much, except when he yelled at you on Horizon, so... <laughs> yeah. Well, but <laughs> Fane, I mean, you could Fane really was just... an option. Not for male ship. He was only for femship. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. I I mean, you, could, you could always just true to be asexual and just hate everything, right? Yeah, yeah there's a lot of people who do, <laughs> like, you know, no romance, Paragon runs, like, no time for uh, the sexy times. <laughs> Which is actually what I'm doing. I'm replaying through one right now, and I'm going to save Caden, and I'm going to incinerate Ashley on Burmeyer. <laughs> <laughs> No one likes well, what is love? Can't uh, have <laughs> can't have space Sarah Palin. Yeah, she is space Sarah Palin. I think she's actually the most killed character. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> there's really nothing likable about her most of the time. She's kind of so. Did, did, did the mechanics change at all for the the single player campaign? Also, uh, from two to three, it's, I would say it's just more polished. Mm-hmm. Uh, from one to three, it's a huge difference. But from one to two, is also you a know. Huge I actually, difference. I actually heard people a lot of a lot of people didn't like the change from one to two. Well, one to do one to two cut out a lot of the RPG elements. Um, so there wasn't as much detail in your leveling. Like for example, I just finished playing Mass Effect one again, and I had about like ten to twelve abilities. In Mass Effect two, you maybe have six at the most. Yeah. Um, there's no inventory system, so all of your armor that you spend time upgrading and you know putting mods on, that's gone in two. So so what does the armor like so what does the armor do in the newest game in three? In in three it's kinda of like in two where you, you have uh, you have like maybe like five to seven or five to seven options for each armor slot, like shoulder, chest, legs, um, arms. Mm-hmm. And each of the seven options give you certain bonuses. Like one might increase your shields a little bit, one might give you more like melee damage. But in one you had, you know, hundreds of armor combination options and in two and three you don't have that many at all. <laughs> All right. Well, is there any other topics you guys wanted to uh, touch on before we jump into the, the last topic? I'm sure we'll uh, burn pretty much twice as much time as we already have. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. All right. So one of the biggest controversies right now is the ending for Mass Effect 3. Mm-hmm. So why don't you guys just go ahead. You know, again, spoiler alert. If you don't want to hear this, just... Turn off the video, go play the game, hurry up and catch up, and then come back and listen to this. But what exactly is the big, horrible ending everyone's complaining about right now? Okay, before they get into it, I, <laughs> I want to say, because I, when I was watching Terra finish the ending, because I, I haven't beaten it myself, but I watch the, a lot of her playthrough, and personally, I enjoyed the final moments, the, the very... The, all of the stuff that led up to the ending and the the ending choice itself was, I thought, very well written in and of itself. It was depressing. It was it didn't give very much closure. It was disappointing, sure, but by itself, the ending for me was very. It, it wrapped a lot of things up, and it was very you, interesting. You felt that it was fitting. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was very fitting. I, I mean, yeah, there should have been a little bit more closure with your squad mates, but. For me, I thought they they kind of gave that in the final mission when you were landing on Earth and you got to talk with all of them right before the final push towards the the Citadel entrance. Mm-hmm. But the ending itself, a lot of people feel came down to you know choose your your colored doorway kind of thing. Wow. Like yeah, you know, there's the the Paragon, the Renegade, and the neutral option. So, so, so before we go any further, what what exactly was the ending like? It was like a play by play. What what's making people complain so much? Okay, well, there's three endings. Uh, I guess we'll just start with the neutral one. Now, the neutral one is controversial because for those of you who played Mass Effect One, you might remember that Saren, his initial deal was that he wanted to create a synthesis between organic and synthetic life, and you know, obviously, you stopped him in one. And that is considered 
the neutral ending in three is that you actually fulfill what Saren wanted in the first place. You take the Reapers, you take all the organic life in the galaxy, you shoot this big green light throughout the entire galaxy, and everything becomes partly organic and partly synthetic. Um, As well, in, in all three of the endings, the Mass Effect relays are destroyed, and in most of them, the Citadel is destroyed as well. Basically, for, to recap from the beginning of, I guess, the beginning of the ending, you uh, you have the final battle on Earth. You go up into the Citadel. Um, you talk with Anderson and the Elusive Man, and Anderson ends up dying. And as Shepard is dying, you go up into an elevator, and uh, the Star Child is there, which is the kid who died on Earth, who's like looks like a ghost essentially, um, and he gives you three options. He tells you about, you know, the synthesis option, which Josh just explained, and then there's the option to control the Reapers, which is what the Elusive Man in Mass Effect 2 was trying to do, and tried to do again in Mass Effect 3, uh, where Shepard would take control of the Reapers and basically die in the process. I don't know how that would work exactly, but it does. Uh, <laughs> the synthesis ending um, was more what Serum was going for in Mass Effect 1, and then the destroy ending is kind of what Anderson wanted to do in Mass Effect 3, which is you just wipe out the Reapers, and in the process, the Geth and ED and any other synthetic life would supposedly die, including Shepard, because Shepard is full of implants. That sounds horrible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at, well, that's, that's, I mean, that's not, not even not the worst... Not to be a jerk, but it feels like a typical sci-fi... The movie was good up until now, and now you're going to hate it at the end. Well, one, one major problem I think people have with it is there there is little closure after you make your decision. Um... All the Mass Effect relays are destroyed, which essentially cuts everyone off from each other in the galaxy. There is, I guess, potential to rebuild the Mass Effect relays at some point, but as of the ending, everyone is disconnected. Uh, most of the planets are destroyed, like the home planets of all the major races have been wiped out almost. Um, and uh, your crewmates in the Normandy somehow end up on another planet, even though they were at Earth, <laughs> um, and they come out of the ship alive. So your crewmates are okay. And in the destroy ending, if you have enough galactic readiness rating, which is the score you get throughout the game for doing a bunch of side missions, uh, Shepard actually takes a breath of air, and it's implied that Shepard's alive. So the best ending you can possibly get is to destroy the Reapers, uh, destroy the Citadel, and destroy supposedly Geth and Edie, and then Shepard lives. And, of course, there, there's, like, 16 endings, depending on your galactic readiness rating. Whether you destroyed or saved the collector base at the end of 2. So, depending on how you, how you actually play through it, your ending may differ. I, I think most people try to get, you know, the, the best ending that they can. But there are endings where everyone dies, basically. Yeah, there is a variance of the destroy ending, for example, where all the soldiers on Earth are wiped out, as well as the Reapers, because they're just engulfed by fire. Yeah. Like, like, by choosing the destroy ending, it just basically destroys Earth as well. Yeah, but basically the endings are extremely similar. The implications, if you think about it, though, are very different. Mm. Like, even though they are kind of color-coded the same, like, after you do the control ending, uh, you know, that means the Reapers are still around, but they're under the command of, I guess, Shepard after Shepard's dead somehow. <laughs> I, I think the, the idea is, like, Shepard sort of... Divides oh, so. divides their conscious his conscious his or well, her consciousness. Well, that's that's synthesis. Into, synthesis is well, exactly what Legion did, and what Legion did was he he died and like threw his his consciousness into all the Geth, um, to give them like sentience. And you're essentially doing the same thing when you do synthesis. Shepard fl flies into that beam and gets you know vaporized. Vaporized, and what, all that is Shepard is you know engulfed in everything, and everyone's DNA is fundamentally changed, where they are now part synthetic. See, my hypothesis with the control ending, because when you control him, for some reason, you still get incinerated. But um, my hypothesis with that particular ending is that when the Star Child said that you can control the Reapers, I think you might have been more so implying that you kind of get like a one wish sort of thing where you tell the Reapers to do one last thing. And I would assume that he would say, you know, hey, leave the galaxy alone. And they just kind of flew away. It's important to note the only way the Citadel is not destroyed is to control the Reapers. But that's not. But that's not in most people's eyes the best ending. Is no, it? the best no, ending cause... in most people's eyes is the one where Shepard's alive. But well, <laughs> mo most people want the um, 
Well, what most people don't like about the controlling is because you're basically trying to stop the elusive man the whole game from doing that thing. Right. But then, then it, you, you like do doing that, that thing. <laughs> yeah, by like doing that, you're saying the elusive man was right. Well, yeah, you, you actually say to the star child, so the elusive man was right, and he says yes, but we already controlled him. So, so he, he could, wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Yes. But but Shepard, being the godlike being that he or she is, <laughs> is able to do it for some reason. <laughs> There's actually a, a, a popular alternate fan theory about the whole ending, which is that uh, Shepard is indoctrinated at the end. And everything from the point when Anderson dies and you go up that, that elevator to where the Star Child is, from that point on, supposedly it's indoctrination and the Reapers so, are trying to. Well, even so, so, you're, so, so you're basically saying that a lot of people want to believe it's just a COVID dream. Pretty much. But yes. it's actually, there's been a lot of uh, evidence that people have found that support it. Uh, I think there's actually videos on YouTube right now. Well, the it, it's not just that part too. What what a lot of people have been pointing out is that um, at on Earth, right before you're able to go to the <clears throat> Citadel, um, you Harbinger, I think, is the one that comes mm. down and he he starts destroying your like the people that are running towards the the beam that will transport you to the to the Citadel itself and continue the fight, and he starts destroying the people that are running with you. And one of the beams hits you, and from that point on, a lot of people have pointed out that um, when you're actually getting up, it seems a lot like the dream sequences that permeate the whole game of Mass Effect 3 as well. Like, the, the transition is very similar, so it seems like everything from that point on is much like the dream sequences, and that's what people have been saying. Uh, personally, like just to, for, I support the indoctrination theory because it makes me feel better about the ending. <laughs> uh, I, as for the evidence for it, I mean, I haven't watched any videos that detail or anything. Just from my playthroughs, what I've noticed is uh, all the way back in Mass Effect 1, which they talk about indoctrination a lot in Mass Effect 1, uh, there's actually this planet that you can scan that's in some, you know, random nebula. And it talks about uh, a Volus who is, camp is like camping out on the planet with like a mercenary crew. Because he had visions of a ghostly, uh, or sorry, a visions of beings of light that warned him about synthetic devils that were trying to control or destroy organic life. Which seems to allude to the star child who is a being of light. Cause, uh, so it kind of makes me think that maybe they had this ending planned all the way back in Mass Effect 1. And maybe the change in writers or directors somehow made it not translate as well in the final game as they originally intended it. Um... But they mentioned that in Mass Effect 1, and then at the end of 3, there a lot of people say when you get up after being hit by the beam, you see the trees from the dreams around you. I mean, I personally didn't notice that, but I haven't gone back to check or anything. Um, let's see, what else is there? Can you think of anything else that supports indoctrination? Uh, well, one other uh, thing that uh, fans of the indoctrination theory like to point out is that... Um, when you reach the ending in Mass Effect 3, normally the Paragon options are colored blue and the Renegade options are colored red. However, it's uh, suggested uh, that it's actually done the opposite when you actually get up to the Citadel and you have to make the final choice. Because as most of us can probably agree, the Elusive Man is supposed to symbolize more so being a sort of Renegade option. and. Anderson and his destruction of the Reapers was more the Paragon route that you had been fighting for essentially since Mass Effect 1. But um, for some reason the control options were colored blue and the destruction options were colored red, despite the fact that, you know, red is the better ending and the blue is not. So Which, that's another yeah. thing that they like to point out as well. <laughs> Which basically implies that the Star Child was trying to convince the player that destruction is not the best one to go for. Which a lot of people said, like, when they got up there, after they listened to the Star Child explain all the different choices, the destruction one sounded the worst. And no one picked it because they thought, like, you know, Shepard's gonna die, the Geth will die, Edie dies, that doesn't Little sound good at all. Little did they know <laughs> Shep can live. Yeah, and, which and that's but is, it, that, is that why everyone was so angry about it? Well, that's another thing. The the Star Child said that Shepard would die if you picked destruction, and the fact that Shepard didn't die also could imply that the Geth and Edie don't, which mm. means maybe he was lying to but you. But in the other endings, if you uh, if you encouraged Edie and Joker to get together, they would appear outside of the ship in 
both the control and the sin- the synthesis endings. I'm pretty sure. Well, in synthesis, mm-hmm. Edie always comes out. In uh, control, it's it's sort of random. The people who come out on the ship at the end depend on who you paid the most attention to in the game. And in the destroy ending, I've never seen Edie come out of the ship. I have. So, I haven't either. So, so that there's not a real clear answer for that one. So mm-hmm. it's not. It, it's something that we can't really. We can speculate on, but it's not clear. Well, another thing about an indoctrination theory is that Shepard does have these dreams throughout the game where she sees the, uh, you know, ghostly images and the child. And if you read the codex entry for indoctrination, it says one uh, symptom of indoctrination is that you see ghostly images. So. So so one of the one of the things is that possibly through the implants given to you at the beginning of two. Or just throughout the game, being exposed to the Reapers, that kind of thing, it, it's indoctrinated. Well, it's, Shepard. Shepard said uh, himself or herself that anyone who goes inside a Reaper ship will be indoctrinated, and you are technically inside a Reaper ship, or at least near them at the end of Mass Effect 3. And when you're talking to the elusive man and Anderson at the end, there are these black tendrils are kind of like on the screen, implying that you're fighting indoctrination. But they never really show up again after that, and you kind of just go up that elevator and talk to the yeah, kid. They they never really mention it. There's a couple of weird things that happen during those those sequences that are like, oh, you know, I, I think one of them was that Shepard accidentally shoots Anderson yeah. while they're being they're both being controlled at this point as well. Like the elusive man is like walking around, and Anderson and Shepard are move are moving not of their own accord. So that that's one other thing that also evidences that they're being more directly controlled, but they can still like think. But yeah, there, and, there's and, lots of indoctrination is supposed to be a slow process, but it can happen quickly. But usually, like the person it destroys mind. their mind. yeah, it destroys their mind, which also would kind of work towards it because it might be like your your mind is being destroyed, so you're having this like nice coma dream that. <laughs> You know, oh, everyone lives. Kind N- of thing, nice you know? coma dream while in re- reality you're just bleeding out on the battlefield. Yeah. Yeah, well, another thing people pointed out is that Hackett um, shouldn't know that Shepard made it to the Citadel. Uh, and, like, Hackett contacts you and says that, you know, nothing's happening, it's something on your end, but how does he even know that anyone made it up there? Well, you are Shepard. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people well, just know, I don't know where, where you you've are. heard, but I'm kind of a badass having all that SpaceX. <laughs> Well, like, the thing about the ending is, like, yeah, I, I said I enjoyed it. I, I would like to see what they do come up with as a better ending, if, if it does end up being the indoctrination theory that a lot of people yeah, they, seem to want. They, they did make an announcement that they are working on, quote-unquote, fixing the ending for the fans. So how do you guys feel about that, them going back and, like, fixing it up after the fact, after the game has come out? I think it'll be fine as long as it's not... Uh, hey, we made a mistake. This is what the real ending is. If they somehow tie it into the current ending, like indoctrination theory, or this is what happens right after, where everything is better, so you guys don't get some out of this. Uh. Like some of the rumors has been that they might change the ending like entirely. I think that might be. A, patch. I feel like that might be a bad idea, just because you're kind of in saying, yeah, the game we made wasn't really the real game. We're gonna, you know. Well, they're the they're, they're doing it from fan reaction. Because, like, there's obviously well, been yeah. a huge thing. Like people. I was. I heard a rumor that, that someone tried to sue Bioware for the yeah. bad ending. Yeah, that was actually covered on uh, the Yahoo News. A uh, few of the more extreme fans had actually filed a formal complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. So, yeah, the the Federal Trade Commission thing. The stipulation would be if they won the suit that any DLC that the uh, that Bioware would put out to quote unquote fix the ending would be free to download. And I I mean, I I don't expect that Bioware would make us pay for that kind of thing when when there's so much bad fan reaction, but I mean, you can't really hurt them for trying to make some money off of the fans. I'm pretty sure they've they've made plenty of money so far with the the sales and the DLC already. And the microtransactions from the multiplayer. (laughs) Because you can buy those packs of cards for Microsoft points. Uh, I I almost can guarantee there's someone out there who's just like, yeah, all the money, just putting it right in there. Just go grow. And I I remember there being a a thread on 4chan that was like, oh, I hate these endings. Uh, I, I will pay... Bioware t- for a better ending, and the the immediate next post was just as EA planned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not saying that 
they planned this from the beginning. Yeah. But really, like, <laughs> I, I haven't had a whole lot of all, like all hands on experience with three yet, and but as as far as if I had my my opinion on it, I would like to say that I feel like instead of like you know fixing the ending, there should be some like major obvious choice before the ending, like basically make like a second path of endings, like. So that way you have you still have all the ending options that are originally there, or you could take some kind of path to have a, some like added on endings, in well, my opinion, because you could still you could still maintain the same storylines that were there, but a lot of people are just saying no, we we just want a whole new ending, like just change everything. I think people want the Gurren Logan ending, which is because <laughs> yeah. essentially the Star Trial the, the is Gurren the anti spiral. Well, because <laughs> the, the Star Trial is essentially the anti spiral, as in you know like. Organics are chaotic. They're going to destroy themselves and consume themselves because they're so chaotic. And we bring order by, you know, killing all of you. So they kind of... They, the anti sprawl element was there, but there was no, like, awesome, like, you know, main character. Get, you know, fuck everything. I'm just going to do whatever. And then, and then he teamed up with all of his teammates and they all used their friendship power combined. Pretty much. Well, I think people really <laughs> wanted that. Yeah, that's, that. Honestly, that's what I was kind of expecting. From I mean, like, you, you've, been, you've been, like, fighting with your teammates since, like, the first game, right? So yeah. you'd expect the ending to involve the team you've been playing with the whole time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's and, also hard to incorporate because yeah. they all could be dead. <laughs> Yeah, that the is thing, true. <laughs> the thing about that and that would be like um, they they did draw a lot of inspiration. It seems from the anti spiral kind of character, but like that that whole last part, the whole last mission was kind of building up to this awesome like boss battle, kind of like oh we're gonna fight like the elusive man or like the harbinger with our fists and just beat the crap out of it or something, you know. But, you know, it didn't come down to that. It came down to, oh, choose choose this doorway to your ending. Like the, and it's like, okay, you know, that's kind of a letdown, but I'll choose like my really, ending. Do you guys feel like they, they did this because it would be easier? Because, like, really, if you had to... I mean, on top of all the endings there already, if you had, like, some kind of giant team up with all your team members, like, how many more endings would that divide it into with the different team member combinations? Oh, God. I think it wouldn't really necessarily divide it more. Like, for example, they would probably just show cutscenes with the teammates in them or not in them. Like, at the end of Mass Effect 2, for example, you see, you know, your crew walking around your ship, everyone's happy, but if half the crew died, it's just they aren't in that cutscene. So you can kind of, like, add and remove people. Well, I think also a lot of people want to see, like, you know, the the various team members, like, fighting the good fight on Earth while you're trying to fight on the Citadel as well. Like, you know, just snapshots, like Grunt and Garrus fighting side by side, or, uh, you know, Tali leading some Geth troops into battle, or something like that. Mm. Well, and also something that bothers people about the ending is, you know, you, you do have some closure with your teammates before the end of the game. You, you talk to all of them. But the part, the thing is that none of, the, none of that closure means anything, because it's not possible because of how the end turned out. For example, you know, Javik talks about going back to his, uh, his one of his planets and... Uh, visiting, you know, the graves of his people and then killing himself along with them. And uh, he can't do that because the mass relays aren't there and he can never reach there. Tali can never go back to Rannoch, her homeworld, and build a house, you know. After you fought this huge war with the Geth to reclaim that planet. Yeah. And Rex can never go back to Tichanka and, you know, have a million babies with Eve. Which uh, you were also <laughs> involved in. <laughs> yeah. There's just, there, all everything the characters talk about doing and all these things that, you know, you care about and they care about can never happen because of the ending. You know, now that Tara's pointed that out, I would like to say that, honestly, if Bioware were to quote-unquote fix the ending or any aspect of it, I would just say Bioware fix the part about the Mass Effect relays being destroyed. The rest of the closure and whatnot, fans can probably fill out with their imagination as long as they know that the Mass Effect relays are there, and these people are not just stranded in the soul system for the rest of their lives. So it's like really like like it's like they like there's no way they can possibly get there happily ever after right now. Yes. Right. Not right now. No. I mean, like it's 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 more realistic that way because like you know not everything works out to be happy sunshine for everyone, but at the same time it's like you know it puts your mind to ease knowing like you have this closure, the game's over. And, you know, thing, things are the way they should be. Right, which is why the ending was such an odd, you know, turnaround from the rest of the game. Because, you know, ever since you, uh, you know, loaded up the game and started up the campaign, it was all about, you know, these characters who have been fighting alongside you this whole time and what they want to do with the rest of their lives after this Reaper crisis is over. But then the last ten minutes 
of the ending where the Mass Effect relays are destroyed and instantly just makes all of their happy endings impossible. It, it just seems to completely destroy everything that the campaign itself was trying to build up to. See, the thing about that playing devil's advocate again, like, the way that I saw it, especially after uh, replaying one again and seeing uh, Terror replay one recently, was that um, something that Sovereign said in one was that they they were the ones that created the, the relays, the, the Reapers, that is. Uh, they were the ones that created the mass relays and allowed organic life to spread along those pathways. So at the end of three, when the Mass Effect relays are destroyed, I saw it more as like a liberation from that control. Like now, now human or you know alien races are allowed to spread however they yeah. wish. And I mean, they, on, on a much larger scale, it is a happy ending because yeah. you know it's it's not just about the team; it's about the whole universe as a whole. Yeah. And they never specifically say that without the mass relays they would be completely cut off. They never say that. They're all of the the spacefaring ships have like mass effect drives that allow them to go from system to system at least. Well, they can never and make takes the, a while. They can never make sure. the jumps from like Soul to the Widow cluster. That's just but too far without the relays. They they also there there's a couple of scenes that I've seen in two, especially that suggest that some of the races might have at least the resources to research, if not already build new Mass Effect relays. Well, like I, the Asari possibly have. That. Like I have, I have just finished playing one, and something that Vigil said, the uh, Prothean VI, uh, said that the Protheans were very close to unlocking the secrets of the Mass relays to build one of their own and like uh, free themselves from this Reaper control of how civilizations uh, build themselves. And the conduit was the key to doing that. So if they have access to the conduit from one, which I'm not sure exactly where that went, uh, then it is possible they could build their own mass relays. They yeah. they mention it into they they say like they know what it is. There's a there's a person in a like a bouncer in one of the bars in the Citadel <laughs> that talks about it. Hey, there's some people over by the conduit talking about something, and I was like, oh. They still know what that is. That's cool. Yeah, like from just from the the themes of one, I can tell they were trying to go for the only solution to the Reaper problem isn't just to destroy the ones that come and invade, but also to make sure they can never come back, which is to rid yourselves of the mass relays. Yeah, I mean, really personally, from what I've heard, I I kind of feel like the complaints aren't as necessary because, like, from personally, like. This isn't the first time a game has had, like, you know, a not-happy-go-lucky ending. Mm. I mean, like, for any fans of the Gears of War universe, the ending to Gears of War 3 is just, like, it is the most, like, bitter ending I've seen in a long oh, time. Yeah. Like, you, you guys have played yeah. Gears of War somewhat, and I don't, I don't think anyone here is going to mind any spoilers or anything, but, like, mm. throughout the whole Gears of War series, you hear about, like, Marcus Phoenix's dad being dead. In the third game, you find out he's alive. Like, you know, in the third game, you, you lose your best friend. Like, Dom dies. Trying to save everybody, and that was like that was the most wow. tearful death I've ever had. Like I, like literally, I had to like stop. Like I cried. Like it was bad. Like they even started playing like Mad World like right after, and you're like, no, this is no, just just turn it off. And then like you get to the ending, your dad basically sacrifices himself to save the rest of the world. You kill the queen, and like mind you, this is this is the third game. Basically, after the whole planet has gone to shit, and there is only like maybe like. Like, half a continent worth of people left to repopulate now. And then just at the ending, you know, Marcus is sitting on the beach, and Anya walks up, and he's like, now we can rebuild. And he's like, well, is it worth it? And, like, it just ends. So, I mean, like, like really, like, bad, like bittersweet endings are not new. If anything, I kind of feel like, at least in the Mass Effect ending, the universe gets off pretty well, because, you know, like, yeah... You cool. either you either destroy control or synthesize with the Reapers, and you're everything's okay. <laughs> Pick your color explosions. But yeah, you know, it, it's I I don't know what it is about this ending particularly. I I don't know why the fan outrage about it was so so like I outspoken. You know what I mean? Because like there there have been really sad endings. Like you know, especially like Gurren Lagann again. Like. You know, when Kamina died, I, I bet there were like half the fans that were like, "I'm not, I'm not watching this." Anymore. A lot of people stopped watching it after that yeah. too. 
which was a mistake. But yeah, because yeah. well, it got because it got amazing. Again, more I don't amazing. think it's that Shepard's that Shepard dies or that any particular person dies that bothers them. It's just the lack of closure and how again all those happy endings you imagine yeah. for the characters will never happen. I I think a a big part of it is that they didn't really expand on the endings. They just kind of were like, okay, these are the endings, and then they give you like 10 minutes of what happens afterward, like immediately afterwards, and then they give you this bullshit like sometime in the future. Or oh, they're, uh, the, the, the winter the, on Mars yeah, ending. the winter on Mars ending with the old man <sighs> talking really to weird. the boy. I did not it like was that. just out of place, and they didn't really explain anything. They kind of, it, a lot of it came out of nowhere, and I think that's what Maybe really we'll caught. Maybe we a sequel. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Mass Effect 4 with like Liara as the main character. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I'd play that. The, the people of Bioware said that this is not the last you'll see of Commander Shepard. So I don't know what that means. We means DLC over uh, means in the future. There's more Shepard. I feel like any time a company says that, like I feel like if they're gonna just release DLC story, they'll say we're just gonna release some DLC story. But it probably means that we will eventually have Mass Effect Four. And I don't know, maybe maybe they'll go into a parallel universe where everything is backwards. Ooh, and well, you're a bad guy. if there is a possibility that there is a Mass Effect Four, I would say that despite my moderate displeasure with the Mass Effect Three ending, I would still definitely pick up a Mass Effect Four if it were made, and I would probably love it just as much as every other game that's been in the series, which is a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like from personal experience, I would say that with most game series. But I'm hoping if you guys get a Mass Effect 4, it doesn't, you know, become a Resident Evil 5. <laughs> just, just saying. I think it became yeah. a Resident Evil 5 when it went from 1 to 2. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my favorite fan theory for what Mass Effect 4 might be is that the main villain is Indoctrinated Shepard. Yeah. Like, like reaper Shepherd Shepard trying Wait, to fight. Mass Effect 4? Yeah. Oh. Like, if the indoctrination yeah. theory is true, the villain would be Shepard indoctrinated by the Reapers. <laughs> that's that's really awful. Be and then you would have to fight a, I don't know, a I think, Harbinger I think that would be very interesting. Like, no, I mean, it would be interesting, but, like, I would have so many feelings about it. Like, I'm standing there with my gun on Shepard, and I'm like, no, I, I don't know if I can do this. And then Critical Mission I, I think I think the last <laughs> time I've seen anything, like, implicated like that is that if you ever played the Dot .hack series... And you had a dot like from the first four dot hat games to GU, if you had a save file on your memory card and you played the uh, the ending for dot hat GU, you fight kite like Ozra or kite, but like if you have your save files from the old game, kite's name is replaced from your kite's name from the original dot hat game. So like you are the Good final God. boss. <laughs> but yeah, so I I think that's about it. Is there any closing statements you guys want to put on about the game? I think everyone should get the multiplayer from Mass Effect 3 and come play with me and Josh. At least. And uh, as far as the single player, despite what you feel about the ending, it is still a very good story and it is not something that you should miss out yes, on. Yes, it's definitely something that you should play. You can skip the ending, uh, you can have Marauder Shields kill you at the end, whatever, you know. <laughs> you so can it's, mute it's totally it as fun. the so, ending so, plays. So I think, it's, I think it's safe to say, you know, Ending aside, love it or hate it, it's going to be a good game. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, Ending yeah. aside, it is probably one of the best games I've ever played. All right, well, that's, that's, that's going to about wrap it up. Um, tune in next week, guys. Uh, like, comment, or subscribe. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for t- tuning in for EXP Cast. Tune in next week for Resident Evil Giraffe Blowjob. Yay!